in uh, 1942 in June uh, we went on the bombing mission as flying bombers Wellingtons over Ruhr or otherwise so called Happy Valley and uh, the trip was uh, we performed everything what was necessary uh, dropped the bombs on the target and uh, on the way back while we were flying over the uh, Zoider Sea, which is uh, the part of Holland, uh, my rear gunner uh, reported an aircraft approaching from the rear. I told him that if this uh, uh, object comes too close, then we'll have to open the fire on him. And uh, my idea was that perhaps it was a, a German fighter aircraft equipped with the searchlight in the nose. So when this thing came close, I wouldn't take any chance on it, and uh, I told my rear gunner to give him a blast. So then he opened the fire on him, maybe 200 yards, and at that distance, this object was uh, almost the size of the moon, which was also vib visible at the same time, maybe possibly a bit bigger. We uh, used the tracers in the machine guns, there were four machine guns in the rear turret, and uh, while this um, rear gunner was shooting, we could follow exactly the trajectory of the shells which were entering the, that particular target. Now, the peculiar thing about it was that um, uh, those were just uh, going in and that was the end of it. They wouldn't fall down. Uh, and uh, so-called tracers. Those tracers would uh, just enter and that was it. Now, for that lasted for possibly, I don't know, maybe two minutes. And after that time, the um, uh, this uh, shining object uh, suddenly uh, changed the position and uh, at a terrific speed moved over to our port side uh, almost at the same distance uh, about 200 yards from the wing and uh, then it stayed there of course then uh, both rear gunner and the front gunner opened the fire on my order and uh, I could see the tracers uh, entering the target again from under two angles, uh, at which I was sure that this was pretty close to 200 yards then, because you could see the angle of uh, uh, crossing the tracers. Yeah. After a while, it moved up, uh, took off at uh, fantastic speed at the uh, at least 45 degrees angle, and they just disappeared between the stars. I personally think they've been around for years and they're documenting what's going on on Earth. For what reason, I don't know. And when I came in on this thing, uh, I, I had my trigger depressed, ready to shoot, and it just took off. But I knew now, like I said, that this was not an ordinary airplane. This is something far beyond anything we were on, even on the drawing board. Mach 10, no way. I'm sure that the Russians have incidents like this, uh, and I'm sure that others, I know that uh, there have been reported from Peru and Argentina and other countries, and even Iran had one uh, that they talked about. So, you know, what, what's, what's this, this is too universal to be a, a singular incident. This is just one of many. If there is a reason for closing it and putting it secret, it's because they're afraid that people will panic because, you know, they're afraid of aliens and the war of the worlds and things like that. And I don't think that's the case, because I don't see any hostile intent in anything that they've done so far. Britain's Ministry of Defense has released 4,500 declassified pages of UFO sightings in British airspace. Beginning on page 295, the Bilton Torres order to shoot down a UFO is finally verified after 52 years of silence. Retired Major Dr. Milton Torres, PhD, U.S. Air Force top jet fighter pilot, 
decorated Vietnam hero and professor of civil engineering, is the only person in the world known to have been ordered to shoot down a UFO. This is his story. This is a model of my F-86D in England with all the same markings that I had in England with the checkerboard squadron that was in with the Queen. And uh, this was the 8060 with the radome here and the ro rocket pod is here holding 24 rockets. And that's what I was supposed to shoot down the UFO with. And this is my favorite airplane. Hey, when I first came to Manston, the first thing we had to do was to, quote, transition to the new airplane. Well, I was already transitioned. I was uh, trained at Perrin Air Force Base in Texas, which did nothing but train F-86D pilots. Okay, when I got there, we had everybody in the squadron had to get up to speed at the same level. We went, fired rocketry at Tripoli. We did all kinds of things. Once we finally knew what we were doing, so they say, they put us on alert. That we had to take a share of the alert. This is for the RAF and the USAF, depending on whoever, which airplanes were on, on duty. We would be on alert, waiting to be scrambled. Now, the scrambles usually were nothing more than uh, some airliner that was lost or, or somebody up there that was in trouble and they wanted us to come up and, and lead them in. That's usually what happened. When I got this scramble, this is a different story. We were at the end of the runway in our alert shack waiting for a scramble order, and I got it. It was somewhere near midnight. I remember the exact time, but it was very close to midnight. I scrambled, we got into the airplane, and took off. The minute I took off, I checked into the GCI site, which was given to me when I took off, and the GCI advised me, pick up a heading of 120 and go gate, which I was already at gate, which means going to afterburner all the way. The, the, the soup was so thick, you couldn't see any lights, you couldn't see anything. Uh, it, was the, it was a set of clouds that went from the ground up to 32,000 feet, and I couldn't see a thing. It was one of these pea soup fogs that they had in England at the time. And during this, these pea soup fogs, this is when they were, they were burning coal mostly in England, and therefore the fogs were really tough. So anyway, they, uh, the minute I got airborne, there was, there was actually before I got airborne, they in, indicated this would be a hot fire measure. Hot fire? I turned and says, you will be ordered to fire 24 rockets. Well, that's a very uh, heavy order. The, the kind of order that you de demand an authentication. So I picked up my little matrix and, and went through the authentication procedure and I looked down and they gave me two letters. Uh, they said, yes, this is our problem. That means I have to fire. From that moment on, it was, I, I didn't know what to hope. This was either a Russian or some aircraft that they wanted to shoot. Were you afraid that you were going to cause World War III? First, I, I, my first concern was, Jesus, this is the first shot of the World War III. I didn't want to hear that, you know, but nevertheless, that's what, it, what, what, what ran through my mind. I, I just went through the motions. I was ordered to fire on this machine, and I was going to fire on it. I was going to salvo rockets, 24 of them. That was my orders, 24 rockets. That's the whole load of shot. So as far as I was concerned, that was my orders, and that's all I was going to do. And being a good fighter pilot, I thought anyway, I'm going to obey my orders and just salute and say, yes, sir, and proceed ahead. I had no idea what it was. So we continued on the mission. I selected the rockets. I was ready to go. They advised me uh, to turn on, on a heading. There'd be a firing. We, we, we actually made what they call an intern vector. So that means my wingman was about five miles behind me. Would turn. We would turn on the same vector, and we would come into this whatever it was, a bomber or whatever. They, they advised me, look uh, on your port side at about uh, 15 miles, that's where it's at. Sure enough, there it was. As big, as I said before, as big as an aircraft carrier as far as the blip was concerned. I, it was an easy lock-on, very easy. My radar was telling me that I was 
giving, I got about $200 overtake on them, over what he was going, and I was going at mark point, uh, 0.92, and uh, we're being, well, mark one would be around 750, we couldn't go that fast. At any rate, I had a, a solid lock, and now uh, came in the target, and uh, it gives you a circle on the radar, and uh, in that circle, they have another little circle, and it has the chisel band. The chisel band is the, is the band you see on the radar when it goes round and round, except in our case it was held still because I was locked on. Anyway, as I was going in, uh, I looked up there, my overtake was holding at about uh, 250, 300 knots, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, closure rate. And then all of a sudden, uh, I got the, the, the started to shrink. This means uh, I'm, I'm going to tell him, I said, Judy, you know, which means to them that uh, I've got the complete intercept on my own. I'm ready to fire. I pulled the trigger and nothing happened, but it, it was coming in and just about two or three seconds to go. It's supposed to go into a flat line where I just put the, the, the the, the dot on the on the line and the the radar takes over all computations and fires the missiles if I have it depressed. Well, that didn't happen. Next thing I know, I look up, I see the jizzle band was in center and this blip was going straight north, straight away from me, and uh, away from me, and it was going at, at I estimate Mach 10 because it was so fast and. The, the RAF told me this time that we've lost our our target. He went off our tar uh, our radar completely. And we have a 250 mile scope, and he's gone. And I said, "Well, he's gone with me too. He's uh, it's out. He's out of range. I'm returning and going home." So I did, and I and they to the home plate. At any rate, when, that's when they told me that uh, call me on the landline, and I got the rest of the information on the landline. Then they told me that the, the, the British sent, were sending somebody down from London to debrief me. And that's all that happened that day. I landed, went home. The, the next morning I went to work. And the, this guy, the, the spook, comes in. And uh, Ron Kane brings him to me. And I had no idea who he was or what. Anyway, he flashed a card that wasn't national secure, but it was an official government bag. And so I expected it might be CIA. Well, who knows what it was? He was a spook. That's all I knew. So I told him the whole story, and he told me, no uncertain terms. Don't tell anybody that this has been declared top secret. And if you open your mouth to anybody, that includes your commander or your wingman or anybody else, if you open up your mouth to anybody, and says we'll get you off of flying status. That was enough for me to be quiet for the rest of the time. In layman's terms. How fast is Mach 10? An SR-71, which is called the Blackbird, uh, is no longer flying for the Air Force, but it was flying at 3,000 miles per hour. Mach 10 is more than like 10,000 miles an hour, 10 times the speed of sound. My Blackbird couldn't, couldn't fly that, and nothing on the drawing board that we've got now can fly that, except maybe the shuttle as it goes through the atmosphere. So those airplanes, those missiles, would go very high speeds, but not like this one because the, this UFO was able to stop and orbit over the ground, come from great speeds to a sudden stop that would kill us uh, with inertia. We would be strained to the straps, so to speak. Uh, uh, with uh, that kind of speed, yet it could accelerate to 10,000 in no, no time at all. So this means there's something beyond uh, our propulsion systems. Now, I can imagine in the future that they have magnetic propulsion systems based on gravitation of, of spheres such as Jupiter and Venus and Mars and what have you, but we don't have that, that system yet until we're able to harness uh, the gravitational pull. We won't be able to do that. These people are doing something uh, with with their propulsion system that we haven't been able to do as yet. That doesn't mean we won't. It probably will. The radar go on. 
But Mark 10 is extremely high speed. Listen, I don't know what this uh, uh, alien spacecraft is made of. The last I heard, it was very light. However, uh, I, uh, we don't have the materials at this time, but we, we will have. Because in the case of the SR-71, those materials were, were, were not together. Uh, they would leak fuel all the time, and the only thing you had to do is get, turn the engines on, and then everything. When you go those speeds, the, those uh, plates would seal itself, and that's beyond us, beyond anything we're doing yet, except for the, I don't know about Mark 10. I don't know what Mark they're going to be able to go to. I don't even guess anymore. But it means it takes a lot of good engineering. My name is Parviz Jafari, and I'm a retired general of Iranian Air Force. At about 11 p.m. on the evening of 18 September 1976, citizens were frightened by circling of an unknown object over Tehran, the capital city of Iran, at a low altitude. It looked similar to a star, but bigger and brighter. They reported it to the tower and was seen by Tower Man 2. He alerted the Air Force Command Post and Deputy General Yusefi decided to scramble an F4J to investigate. The pilot in the first jet lost instrumentation and communication when he got too close to the brilliant object so he headed back. About 10 minutes later, they scrambled a second jet which I was piloting. At the time, I was a squadron commander. I approached the object, which was flashing with intense red, green, orange, and blue. The light was so bright that I was not able to see its body. The sequence of flashes was extremely fast, like a strobe light. We locked on it with radar at, it was at 30 degrees left, at range of 25 miles. The size on the radar scope was comparable to that of a 707 tanker. Four other objects with different shapes separated from the main one at different times during the, this close encounter. Whenever they were close to me, my weapon were jammed and my radio communications were garbled. One of the objects headed toward me. I thought it was a missile. I tried to launch a heat seeker missile to it, but my Missile panel went out. Another followed me when I was descending on the way back. One of the separated objects landed in an open area radiating a high bright light in which the sands on the ground were visible. We could hear emergency squash at all the way which was reported by other airliners flying at the time and continued for another couple of days. During my interview at headquarters, after the incident, the American Lieutenant Colonel Alan Moy took notes, but after it was over, I could not find him to talk with. Later at once, Later, once classified document was released here in America through the Freedom of Information Act, the Defense Intelligence Agency documented the event in a great detail, and it was sent to NSA, the White House, and the CIA. The DIA assessment said this case is a classic that meets all necessary conditions for a legitimate study of the UFO phenomena.
Then I would be happy to answer question and tell you more. Thank you. Mi nombre es Oscar Santa María Huertas y soy oficial piloto de la Fuerza Aérea del Perú en situación de retiro actualmente. Good morning, Jill. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Oscar Santa Maria Huertas, official pilot of the Peruvian Air Force, currently retired. El 11 de abril de 1980, a las 7 y 15 horas de la mañana, 1,800 hombres estaban en formación en la base aérea de La Joya, Arequipa. On April 11, 1980, at 7.15 in the morning, 1,800 men were in formation at the air base of La Joya, Arequipa. Todos ellos observaron un objeto estacionario en el aire, que parecía un globo, como a 5 kilómetros de distancia y a unos 600 metros de altitud. Era luminoso porque reflejaba el sol. They all observed a stationary object in the sky, in the sky which looked like a balloon, at about 3 miles distance, and approximately 1,800 feet altitude. It was luminous because it reflected the sun. Mi comandante de unidad me dio la orden de despegar en mi jet Sukhoi 22 para dispararle al objeto esférico porque estaba en espacio prohibido, sin permiso y temíamos espionaje. My unit commander ordered me to take off in my Sukhoi 22 jet to shoot down the spherical object. It was in restricted airspace without clearance and we were concerned about espionage. Yo me acerqué al objeto y le disparé 64 obuses de 30 milímetros. Algunos obuses fueron contra el terreno y otros le pegaron de lleno al objeto, pero sin ningún efecto. Los obuses no rebotaron, probablemente fueron absorbidos. La pared de fuego en forma de cono que yo mandé normalmente hubiera destruido cualquier objeto en su camino. I approached the object and struck 64 30 mm shells at it. Some projectiles went towards the ground and others hit the object fully, but they had no effect at all. The projectiles didn't bounce off, probably they were absorbed. The cone-shaped wall of fire that I sent out will normally obliterate anything in its path. El objeto entonces empezó a subir y a alejarse de la base. Y cuando yo estaba a unos 11,000 metros, de repente se detuvo, forzándome a salir del lado porque ya me encontraba a solo 500 metros de él. Entonces, Hice un ascenso para atacarlo desde arriba, pero justo cuando ya lo había centrado en la mira y estaba listo a disparar, el objeto hizo un ascenso vertical evadiendo mi ataque. The object then began to ascend and move farther away from the base. When I was about 30,000 feet, it made a sudden stop, forcing me to veer to the side since I was only 1,500 feet away. I flew up higher to attack it from above, but just as I had locked on the target and was ready to shoot, the object made a straight vertical climb, evading the attack. Dos veces más tuve al objeto en la mira, cuando este se encontraba estacionario, y cada vez se alejó al último momento antes de mi disparo, siempre evadiendo mi ataque. Two more times I had the object on target, when the object was stationary. Each time it moved away at the very last minute, when I was about to fire, always eluding my attack. Entonces, decidí hacer un ascenso a toda velocidad para ponerme muy por encima del objeto, pero este empezó a subir también y casi en paralelo con mi avión. Cuando sobrepasé los 19,000 metros, el objeto se detuvo. I decided to climb at full thrust to get above the object, but it began to ascend almost parallel to my plane, and when I reached 63,000 feet, it stopped. Fue entonces que me acerqué a 100 metros del objeto. Tenía unos 10 metros de diámetro, estaba como esmaltado con una cúpula de color crema sobre una base metálica ancha y circular. No tenía motores, ni escapes, ni ventanas, ni alas o antenas. Carecía de todos los implementos típicos de un avión y sin ningún sistema visible de propulsión. At this point, I came to within about 300 feet of the UFO. It was about 30 feet in diameter. It was enamel, cream colored dome with a white circular metallic base. It had no engines, no exhaust, no windows, no wings or antenna. It lacked all the typical aircraft components with no visible propulsion system. Fue en ese momento que me di cuenta que esto no era un objeto para espiar, sino que era un ovni. 
algo completamente desconocido. Ya casi no tenía combustible, o sea que ya no podía ni atacar ni maniobrar mi avión, tampoco escaparme a alta velocidad y sentí temor, quizás este era mi fin. It was at that moment that I realized this, is not, this is, was not a spying device, but that it was a UFO, something totally unknown. I was almost out of fuel, so I couldn't attack or maneuver my plane or make a high-speed escape. I was afraid. I thought I might be finished. Entonces, logré calmarme y avisé por radio que otro avión viniera para echar un vistazo. Me dijeron que no, que estaba demasiado alto, que simplemente me regresara. Tuve que planear parte de mi descenso por falta de combustible, haciendo zigzag y siempre viendo por mis espejos retrovisores con la esperanza de que el objeto no me persiguiera. No pasó nada. When I had calmed down, I ready for another plane to come and I have a look trying to hide my fear. They say no, it's too high, just come back. I had to glide part way down due to lack of fuel, zigzagging to make my plane harder to hit always with my eyes on the rear view mirrors, hoping it wouldn't chase me. It didn't. Pasé 22 minutos de maniobras contra el objeto. Después de que aterricé, el objeto permaneció estacionario en el cielo por dos horas más a la vista de todos en la base. I had spent 22 minutes maneuvering with this object. After I landed, the object remained stationary in the sky for two hours for everyone at the base, at the base to see. Un documento del Ministerio de la Defensa de los Estados Unidos, intitulado OVNI visto en Perú, describió el incidente, diciendo que el origen del objeto sigue desconocido. A U.S. Department of Defense document titled UFO Sighted in Peru described the incident, stating that the vehicle's origin remains unknown. Todavía me da escalofrío cuando me acuerdo. It still gives me chills to think about it. Muchas gracias. Às 8h50 da noite de segunda-feira, um ponto luminoso é detectado pela torre de controle do aeroporto de São José dos Campos. A torre pede ao comandante Alcir, que viajava com o coronel Osiris Silva, presidente da Petrobras, que fizesse uma busca visual do homem. 21 horas e 10 minutos, sinais luminosos são vistos pelo comandante Alcir. 21 e 14, o controle de radar de São Paulo recebe sinais sem identificação. 21 e 15, o controle radar de São Paulo informa o centro de tráfego aéreo em Brasília. 21 horas e 20 minutos, Brasília confirma a presença de sinais no radar. 22 horas e 23 minutos, o primeiro jato F-5 sai da base aérea de Santa Cruz. 22 horas e 45, o radar de Anápolis detecta sinais. O Mirage sai da base em busca dos OVNIs. 23 horas e 15 minutos, o piloto do primeiro F-5 a entrar em ação vê bolas de luz pela primeira vez e começa a perseguir os OVNIs. 23 e 17, mais um Mirage sai da base de Anápolis aumentando a perseguição. 23 horas e 20 de segunda-feira, o F-5 recebe pela primeira vez sinais no radar de bordo. 23 e 36 minutos, o terceiro Mirage sai da base de Anápolis. O comandante Alcir da Embraer foi o primeiro a ver esses objetos luminosos quando voava de Brasília para São José dos Campos junto com o coronel Aziz. Como é que foi isso? Isso era uma estrela, uma estrela bem luminosa, de cor alaranjada, de avermelhada, parecida assim. É... Quando então nós informamos ao controle de São José dos Campos que iríamos prosseguir em direção a esse objeto, sei lá, ou a essa luz. E essa luz simplesmente desapareceu, como se fosse uma luz que tivesse apagado. Tem ideia da velocidade desse ponto de luz, já que o senhor estava se aproximando e ele se distanciando? Estava acima de mil quilômetros por hora, porque naquele momento eu estava aproximadamente mil quilômetros por hora. O senhor tem ideia do que poderia ser isso? Infelizmente não, um ponto de luz, porque nosso objetivo justamente era esse, se aproximar e identificar. Nós não conseguimos nem nos aproximar, muito menos identificar. Capitão, chegou a se falar em uma certa perseguição desses pontos luminosos à sua aeronave, como é que foi isso? Bom, quando eu estava me dirigindo para a área de busca, São José dos Campos, eu fui recebendo informações do radar de que haviam de 6 a 8 pontos luminosos à minha frente, aproximadamente a 18 milhas. E a noite estava completamente clara e eu não via nada. E 
o controle foi me informando que a distância está diminuindo, que está se aproximando e mantendo a minha frente. O senhor sentiu medo? Não, medo não. Eu senti muita curiosidade. Não sei, talvez diria que não senti medo porque não via, estava visual. Então realmente eu não estava vendo nada. Então eu acho que eu não tive sensa a sensação de medo porque não estava vendo nada me ameaçando. Estamos transcrevendo todas as fitas de comunicações entre os pilotos e controladores, entre os controladores da área de Brasília, da área de São Paulo e de Anápolis, e posteriormente poderemos chegar a uma conclusão se seria ou não um tráfego classificado dentro dos critérios de defesa aérea. Toda vez que é detectado algum objeto não identificado, evidentemente há um processo uh, bastante uh, eficiente de verificar se foi alguma aeronave que está voando sem um plano de voo aprovado, etc. Mas quando se comprova que é, é algo diferente, as aeronaves então são acionadas. O que ocorreu foi que os radares uh, detectaram vários objetos não identificados na área de uh, São Paulo, São José dos Campos, Rio de Janeiro. De vários uh, minutos, as aeronaves nossas que decolaram foram acompanhadas por esses objetos. Era um, uma aeronave teve, foi acompanhada por cerca de sete de um lado e seis do outro. Agora, qual é a explicação, não podemos dar ao senhor, porque nós não temos essa explicação.